Welcome. All right. So welcome to our Inside the Trader's Mind call. Um, really going to love this conversation tonight and a couple of topics that were sent in. Now, if you are new here, the rules are if you have a breakthrough or a little aha moment or something just is fucking mind blowing for you, what you're going to do is you're going to go into the chat and you're going to go hashtag blue wolf, right? And that symbolizes a 10 USD dollar, I said that really weird, a $10 USD donation <laughs> that um, Trade House Australia then donates on behalf of your breakthrough. Um, at the moment, we are supporting a medical care for a, a charity that deals with women and children being rescued from child sex trafficking. Okay, so really important matter. Your breakthroughs matter. Um, your breakthroughs are important. So please go to fucking town. Okay, we're almost over 60 USD this year in, in donations, which is pretty fucking dope. That's a lot. Guys, I never used to make that in one year and now we're able to donate that. $60 or 60,000? 60,000, Leon. That's great. Okay. $60. I'd be like, here you go. Just have a deal. Is there one that eating a dollar or something? 60,000 USD. So your breakthroughs matter and we need to know about them. Okay. So let's kick it off. I want to first kick off this conversation with you both um, around the topic of accepting risk and losses. Okay. So you know, what we see as, as mentors time and time and time again is new traders come in or even traders that have been trading for a long time and they're struggling and they, they like to make trading a matter of right or wrong, okay? And the moment that a trade is placed, they kind of have this expectation to win, okay? Which then naturally brings on disappointment if they lose, okay? So, when the, when the potential of disappointment exists, um, another way, you know, we like to call that is loss aversion bias, okay? And it has, it basically has the effect of changing the way someone perceives the market, okay? And this often results in, you know, a number of trading mistakes that could have been prevented, um, more losses, over trading, over leveraging, um, you know, revenge trading to make up for the losses. Okay. And so a, a real life analogy or example for this would be um, in Australia, we have, we can get these things called scratchies, Mike, and those in America and Europe, do you have scratchies where like you go and buy, then you scratch off and you hope to like win money? Scratch cards. What are they called? Crack cards. <laughs> scratch cards. Oh, scratch cards. <laughs> Crack cards, same, same. <laughs> okay, Mike, do you have those? Yeah, they surely do. Surely. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to call them scratchies because that's what us Aussies call them is scratchies. Okay, so whatever. Drop a one in the chat if you've ever bought one and, and, and or scratched one. Do you know this what? Is... I've never have. Have you never? Oh, I've never done a lottery and I've never done Do they come in rolls? Yeah, yeah, you get them from like the news agency or the store and you buy like, I want like a $5 scratchy or something like that. Yeah, but like there's multiple of yeah, those $5 yeah. ones. See, I always thought it was funny if you could just buy the, well, like people do, <laughs> they buy the entire roll, you know, yeah. and uh, in theory, right, you should be more profitable, but more times than not, they're not. Are you allowed to buy the roll? Yeah. Okay. Fuck, that would cost you so much. I thought that'd be like a limit on how much you can buy no, and usually, well, at least out here, the deeper the number is in the roll, because there's like, you know, number one, number two, all the way to whatever. Usually it's the deeper numbers uh, that actually are the winning numbers to make the money back, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so most people have used one. We all know about them. OK, but I just want you guys to like a real life analogy example is I want you to imagine that you've just bought a scratchy um whatever you want to call it and think about the process of doing that right the act of you know tapping your card or pulling money out of your wallet to buy the scratchy when we think about that that is basically a way of saying that you've accepted the risk of losing money because you've invested in it right yes and yes we can agree on that so you can't scratch anything unless you have accepted the risk 
Okay. And since you've bought the scratchy, you know, the, the acceptance literally means, you know, taking what is offered. Okay. So here you buying the little scratch card basically implies that you are at peace with the fact that you might lose your money. Okay. And the money that you use to buy the scratchy is essentially the money that you were willing to you uh, willing to lose whether or not you know if you if you win or not okay so once the the scratchy is bought you literally have no other choice but to scratch it and to see if you know the if you get three in a row or whatever it is um shows up before you know taking any action whether that's chucking it in the bin or collecting and reinvesting <laughs> okay so you might hope to win, you might pray, you might fucking, I don't know what you may do, but when you buy the scratchy, you kind of know in your mind that you're likely to lose. Okay. So even though you might feel disappointed when you don't win, surely that feeling can no longer linger because you've accepted the risk. Okay. So I guess this is where your expectations are in line with the with the negative expectations of that sort of game. So in my, I wanted to use that because I was like thinking today, I'm like, what is a real life normal example that kind of applies to trading? And that's literally all I could think of. So trading is similar yet different. Okay, so whoever you guys can rock, paper, scissors it, whoever wants to go first, how do you get better at accepting, accepting risk and losses? I'll go, Leon, if you don't, yeah. if you, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool, mate. Yeah. So I think that in general, um, the more times that we lose, the easier, of, of course, simply it becomes. But what matters is not, again, so much simply the loss, it's what we lose, what the loss cost, not the loss, but again, what the cost associated with it. Like, again, if you were to go to a bar uh, or some kind of uh, social, you know, whatever, and talking to somebody that you're attracted to, a lot of people, again, because again, this doesn't apply just here. Now, there's monetary value specifically to trading, of course, but even uh, even outside of that, the brain, our mind still interpret risk the same way. It even well, it, with that being said, again, monetary value is an, a thing that gets compounded onto it. But just in general, the idea of risk or exposure, SJ, I don't know. No, I don't think it was you. There, no, no, it, it, yeah, it wasn't. It was at that walk in. There's this story. It's from Vargas. Uh, it's a it's a video on YouTube. I don't have the name of it, but it was essentially about like a social gathering and there was music playing or whatever, and nobody was dancing. And then one person said, no, I'm going to start dancing because that one person finally decided to say, hey, you know what? I don't care what essentially anybody else thinks or whatever, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to have fun because everybody in, you know, that environment was essentially thinking about what everybody else would think if that, you know, if that individual is going to go out there and dance, right? The risk in that case, in that um, little example, it's uh, the risk of judgment. It is still the same. If you guys have ever been in any kind of situation like that before, like at a, uh, you know, maybe at a bar or, you know, a wedding or whatever, where no one is really, again, kind of getting into it, so to speak, because nobody else is getting into it, so to speak, until that one person does it, then another person does it, then another person does it, and then by the time, you know, just a little bit longer. Everybody is, of course, starting to have fun. <clears throat> Risk is allocated to exposure. That's how the brain interprets it. I'm exposed. Like, again, in my example, when you are the first person that is, again, going against uh, the status quo or the norm or whatever, there is a leap of faith, uh, so to speak, of 
letting go of judgment, letting go of other people's opinions, or of course in trading, the letting go of specifically the outcome. And that brings it back into trading. The only reason why loss should ever really truly mean something is when we, all of us, you know, whoever is trading what I would, of course, say is the wrong way. If that loss represents a a high, high loss, you know, 20 percent of the account, 50 percent of the account, you know, blowing the account then of course, absolutely, (laughs) you should be worried about that if people are doing that. But on the other hand, if they are not, again, allocating that much exposure to the market or to whatever, of course, ends up happening and they are risk management or allocating their risk appropriately, the way that I always teach about it and the way that I always, of course, uh, talk about it, and I was talking about this on my session tonight as well, is that, first of all, losses are inevitable, but even specifically within trading, losses, or even, in fact, each individual trade that we get into today, this week, this month, next year, should not mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Because what we should be focusing on is, again, progress not profits Hmm. and i feel as if if people are worried about losing trades that at least in my opinion more than likely is coming from how much people are losing or have lost in previous trades but again if we are um trading and allocating risk in such an appropriate way one win can mitigate multiple losses. My brain, my mind, is much more comfortable walking away or getting away from the charts or anything because of that understanding. I can walk away because even in the worst case scenario, I'm okay with that. In my opinion, the only time that loss ever I'll use the word hurts or is damaging or again, where we can't walk away from it or we are scared of it or whatever, of course you want to call it is because again, we absolutely have too much on the table or too much exposure. How do we overcome that? In my opinion, in trading is math. If you were not comfortable risking, let's say, 2% of your account, then stop risking 2%. Go to 1%. Go to half a percent. If you are not comfortable with whatever the number is, then stop using that number. Everybody has a different risk appetite. If you were going to risk less, yes, of course, you're going to make less as well. And if you have a higher risk appetite, yes, you're going to risk more. But of course, you also have the potential of making more. But there is no right or wrong answer necessarily as as long as, of course, the risk management or the math makes sense, whatever those numbers might be. But if you, if anybody feels an emotional reactionary based response to a trade that any of us get into, Aside from the fact that you, you know, uh, over leveraging or anything like that, because that is a whole other conversation. If you were using risk management and doing it that way, and you were still not able to the, the typical way I put it of if you cannot go to sleep, if you cannot put your head down and be comfortable, like without. Uh, again, picking up your phone or whatever and looking at it, it's too much. Losses are inevitable. So how do we overcome it? Well, if you guys have been trading long enough, you probably have experienced a winning streak, 10, 15, whatever many trades, and then one, two, three, a series of losses wipes it all out. 
the exact same, or I'm sorry, the opposite of that logic is also true. You could literally lose more. You don't have to win every trade you get into. In fact, you could lose more. Win less trades and still be profitable. My point meaning you can set the bar, not that we want to, of course, we want to win every trade we get into, but what I'm doing or what I'm talking about is we could also set the bar very low to where one winning trade mitigates one, two, three, however many losses. So the fear of loss should, in again, the way I consider it, it should be easy or acceptable. Because again, if you trade in, in such a way to where that is the reality, and he, because again, what's the alternative? One loss is ca catastrophe. Have you guys experienced it? One, one bad or maybe two, you know, just a series of bad trades is catastrophe. And you lose 20, 30, 40, 70% of your account in a night or 100%. Instead of that, the alternative. That's how I got over the idea of losses, much less like anything else. But math is my easiest answer. Love it. Leon. Yeah, I truly believe like what Mike said, if, if you ain't following your plan and your confirmations, then obviously that loss is going to feel like a sting because you ain't been following your plan. You not followed your rules of what you've got right in front of you. So you're going to obviously constantly be looking at your phone, et cetera. And if that ain't the case and you are following your rules and your plan, then you got to realize you have no control over what the market does once you're in that trade. Whether it goes up or down is completely irrelevant. Once you're in, you're in. If you've set the bar and you've set all your confirmations and everything's just on par with exactly what you're looking for, you can't really focus on anything else but whatever the trade does after it finishes, whether it hits your stop loss or your take profit. It doesn't really matter because you can't control. There's no point you focusing on something you can't control. There's, you have no control over once you're in the market. So as long as you're following your plan, there shouldn't be no risk. You shouldn't be fearing losses if you're doing everything correctly. And if it does hit your loss, guess what? What can you learn from it? You know, it's a good saying that God, universe, whatever you believe in, is going to continuously keep testing you until you've learned from it. So you've got to understand, like, what, what are you doing wrong, emotionally wise and, and physically wise on the charts, that something is keep testing you to, to really learn from that lesson. So... You know, it's like Mike said, you know, if you're following your plan and your rules and the structure of what you're supposed to be doing, you shouldn't really be focused on your 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 loss or your win. It should be a flat line of emotion of like, if I win this trade, great. If I lose this trade, great. I, I knew my risk. I knew my reward. And I'm accepting both ends. It doesn't matter what happens to it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I um. Like, so basically, guys, to sum that up, I guess what you're saying is, and I agree with you, trading, uh, sorry, losing is not the problem, right? It's it's to look at them as a problem is the problem, okay? Because trading losses is, is a part of the business. Like, it's a business expense and everyone goes through those losses. You can't avoid them. The best thing that you can do is to minimize their impact through risk management, right? And it's, it's it, I think we can go a step further and, and say that trading isn't about being right. You know, nobody knows if you're going to be right or wrong. We don't have to know that. It's not our job to know that. The only thing that you all need to know on the charts is, do you have your edge, right? What is your, your maximum potential risk that you're comfortable? Like just because you see educators say, I don't risk more than, you know, one to 2%. That doesn't mean anything if your own personal risk threshold, like if your nervous system gets so fucking dysregulated at risking 1%, then that's something you need to address. And the only way that you can address that is going through like a full physiological state, which is why if you're any of my crew, I get you to journal your emotions whilst trading, right? Your physiological state, okay? You need to get your nervous system in check. So the only thing that you can you can you know, control is your edge, your, your maximum potential risk, right? 
what are the, the potential profits and, and is the risk being taken worth that profit? So your risk to reward and what's your exit strategy? They're the things that you can control. Whether you win or lose doesn't fucking matter because your, you, your loss shouldn't be a surprise. How much you lose shouldn't be a surprise. Like when you when it hits your stop loss, you shouldn't be like, oh, I didn't think it was going to be that much. That's information that you should know before pulling the trigger. If you don't, then reality slap for you right there. Okay. I think that comes with experience as well. Mm-hmm. You know, the more you get that emotion and feeling and the more you do something, you know, the, the better it becomes. Yeah. So I guess, you know, the more trades you place, you will learn a lot from that. But if you're scared to pull the trigger, then, you know, that's it's going to be very difficult for your whole journey. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, I want to talk over trading. You know, what, what would you recommend a person who is over trading? But then there's another little sting bit over trading profit profitably <laughs> so it's like when you take a trade wrong i i don't my phone's fucking dead so i can't bring up the question um but it was along the lines of i'm over trading but i'm profitable so it's obviously feeding into them being right therefore it's it's making them over trade more so two part question i guess it's like that it's like the you know the the conversation around when you break your trading plan and you're profitable when you do that maybe they, they need to find their range they need within trading maybe they they're hitting limits that you know they undervalue maybe they're you know they should value what they are gaining and maybe that's their edge within trading of what they can consistently do you know so their range within trading is exactly what they're reaching and maybe their range was a little bit too lower previously. So they, they can hit them targets and they can sit consistently hit them targets. So if they can consistently hit them targets, why not keep doing that? It's only if it's not consistent and it's not working, they should focus on it. But if it's working and it's consistent, why not, why not continue that? Mm-hmm. So maybe it's the plan that needs to change. Yeah. More so, can we speak to the behavior? So maybe, and, and, and the behavior, the answer would come from your own past experience. Like if you guys have ever overtraded, how did you combat that? Okay. So if I overtraded, I was going against my trading plan. Yeah. But if I was overtrading and it was consistent, then I would need to fix my trading plan. But if I was overtrading and it was going wrong, then I need to fix that. So I don't know. There's two ends of the stick you could really go with that question. It's quite a hard question to ask because if it's going right, then what are you doing wrong? Yeah. You know I mean? So it's just like, yeah, it's it's quite a lot. But if you're over trading and it's going wrong, then you, there, there's something you need to fix. But if you're over trading and it's going right, then the plan needs to change realistically. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know. It's, it's a hard, that's a hard question to answer, to be honest. Yeah. Mike, what do you think of that? Well, what's the two part to the question, SJ? Because I have three different ways I think I want to answer this. It's, but it's, what is overtrading to a sense of somebody else? A me placing a hundred trades could be overtrading to somebody else. Hundred trades is like ah, that that's not my plan. I have three hundred trades on my plan. So depends if they're scalping, intraday swing traders, how many trades are placed in a month, to what they can trade. Like there's so many things that you could add to that question. Well, my first thing, I'm sorry, let me. I was going to read to you again. Go, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So the question is, what would you recommend a person who is over trading and is trading? Profitably. Oh my God. No, I fucking read it wrong. Hang on. My phone's just plugging back in. I read it wrong. <gasps> This is going to be the game changer. Over tra- over trading, but not profitable. Then, yeah, that's a different subject. No, no, that's <laughs> wait. My phone is, is now has now come back to life. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Fucking, I got it way wrong. I was trying to memorize them. Okay, what would you recommend to a person who is over trading and trading every probability? I thought my brain registered profitability to probability. So they're literally trading every single setup they see, i.e. breaking trading plan. Yeah, that's, that's dangerous. Yeah. Go, Go Mike. 
call my. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, okay. So what I was <laughs> thinking about is, yeah. <laughs> trading every probability is insanity because right now you could find if you searched hard enough you will find one somewhere on some charts so even by that logic by definition right now you're breaking the rules yeah because there is always somewhere somehow a way of convincing ourselves that that is going to be the case over trading or uh revenge trading or anything like that in my opinion stems from the intention the thing that would drive over trading would be in my opinion and again what i have experienced in uh my own personal trading and again just interacting with people is scarcity that they are trading simply because of or whatever you want. And that therefore, they're trying to get into trades to pay rent, to pay an electric bill, to do any of those things. Because it is not, it, it, at least from my opinion, it, it maybe again, there's other conversations around it. There is a reason why over trading happens. And whatever the cause of that over trading is, in my opinion, is pressure from extenuating circumstances, things that are completely outside of trading charts, all of that. And we are using trading and charts and all of that as a potential solution. But the irony of it is, is that the market depends on that to take advantage of us. Because then we do not make good decisions. That's where revenge trading, over trading, babysitting, all these other things, because it's not just simply over trading, in my opinion. I think that all of those, you know, main problems all come from the same place. Maybe other people in here do not over trade. Maybe other people in here don't do that at all, but revenge trade but for the same reasons. And that reason, again, could be for, again, any other pressure or things that are happening in other, you know, an electric bill, an insurance payment, whatever. The point is, and what I always try to get people to understand, is that by definition, that's not what trading is for. Trading is not meant to immediately supplement or replace income. The problem is, is that it's theoretically possible. And I was explaining this even on my session earlier tonight. The problem with trading is that, yes, people can get into trading, literally know nothing, have a $100 account, $1,000 account, whatever, and turn it in to $10,000 because their favorite color is red and they hit the red button and the market happens to go in their favor. Therefore, that's their that's people's perception of trading. So therefore, that is the expectations. The trap of trading is that it is possible to make a very big amount of money very quickly. The market does the, the market is designed to do that on purpose to get people in a trap of expectation of that's what the market can do. Now, again, yes, by definition, yes, it is true. It's not consistent, though. It is not something that we could build a career off of. It is not something that, again, we can really sustain ourselves. Because following that logic, the one time that we're wrong, catastrophe, destruction of that account. So over trading, revenge trading, all of that, I always will come back to the same answer because it is, in my opinion, it is the same answer. It's math. You can, in the way that I, again, that I personally approach trading and the way that I talk about it is that all of those things 
should not even be a variable if you were using math, period. You should not be able to overtrade, to revenge trade, to uh, move, take profits and stop losses or whatever because of math. Or another word of putting it is progress. I was, again, talking about this on my session tonight. People are focused so much on profit and loss, the dollar amount, the dollar amount. Imagine again, not focusing on that, especially if you were new to trading and that if we can all again acknowledge that these are things that we were not taught how to do and that we've all been taught to trade time for money and here we are learning to trade money for money. If we are all to understand that, then by definition, we are not equipped to again, navigate through these waters the way that we need to. So there's a learning process. Is it a year? Is it two years? Is it four years? I don't know. I can't answer that for anybody else. But the way that I always put it, the same thing that is done to make $5 is the same exact trade that can be done to make 50. If we, again, understand how that happens and how that works, guys, in the beginning of our trading journey, because everybody here, in my opinion, should understand that if you were here and you were legitimately trying to learn trade and that you, just as much as me or, again, <laughs> what I would feel is everybody here, that we are trying to turn this into a career, then we're not just going to trade for a year. We're not just going to trade for two years. This is a career. And so through that process, especially in the beginning, as much as we would all like for it to be centered on the idea of us making money. Because, of course, I would like for that to be the case as well. It simply is not. Mm. And maybe that's a hard pill to swallow. You know, a lot of people really need, maybe not just want, but maybe you need to make, you know, because of, again, bills or this or that or whatever the very fact that that pressure is there is exactly why you're here but this is again not the immediate solution mm. and it's not easy to maybe necessarily accept that which is understandable but this in my opinion is the progression or the longer term solution because this is in fact guys trading is not about paying bills that's what jobs are for but all of us have bills and it's pressure it, it it's not that i'm mitigating the fact that those real things in our life are relevant and important and again creating pressure and problems and all these other things in our lives but if you're only ever, and this is what I did, and maybe a lot of you guys can, you know, resonate with this as well. We have only ever been taught to stay at necessarily break even or just to, you know, break even with the bills, not to, you know, grow out of them, so to speak. We are only ever taught to break even or just to pay the bills. Mm -hmm not necessarily grow higher or further than that to where bills are not a problem. It is a, in my experience, at least a new concept. And so that's what trading is. Where revenge trading, again, what this whole question was about was how does that stop? Well, in my opinion, it's math. Easy math, in my opinion. Instead of worrying about profit or loss or anything, what if you focused on the same action. Uh, we've talked about this a hundred times. If that were to happen, what would happen to your life personally in let's say a year? What if it was two years? What if it was four years? If that is not worth it to you, that's absolutely okay. But for the ones that do see the worth or the value in that, the same thing that is done to make $5 
is the same thing that is done to make 50, 500, 5,000, 50,000, not as an income claim. That's just literally how trading works. And so my point is, is that how all of those things get disassociated with your trading is that we understand what it is that we're doing. It is not so much, again, about the pressure of things that are happening in our lives, which I would guess is why overtrading, why revenge trading happens, why overleveraging happens, why greed is allowed to exist. Or if you have a stop loss, you move it lower because you don't want it to hit the stop loss. So you move it lower. Then it gets to that. Then you move it even lower. All of those emotions, all of those things. If we understand, just like what Leon was saying, if you, under, if you do not understand how much you're going to lose, you can't go to sleep. You mm -hmm. can't walk away from it. If you do, however, know exactly, exactly what you were willing to risk and what you're willing to make, it's so much easier. I want to give another hard pill to swallow just super quick. <laughs> Since we're on the topic of prescribing meds, basically. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not one of those mentors that'll blow wind up your ass and tell you how good you are in the sense of, you know, yes, I will tell you that, <laughs> but not to, to comfort you and, and, you know, give you a little fucking care bear to sleep at night. All right. Um, if you work with me, you know, we, we work on the stuff that you need to work on to, to get the results that you achieve, you want to achieve. So on, with saying that, what I want to say here is in this industry where, you know, there's four is, I saw Jenna in the chat. She's here. You've got four traders on here that are educators, mentors, all trading full time, right? We've got Mikey's been here the longest, me and Leon been here seven years, Jenna's going on five. We've been here a long time, right? We've had the success we've had because we've been here a long time. So when I say anyone, do I think anyone can become a really good trader and extremely profitable? Yes, I do. Do I think all 35 of you on this call will? Absolutely not. And the reason I say that, okay, and I say this because I once said this to one of my guy students who now recently got funded and it blew a fucking rocket up his ass. He's like, I don't want to be that stat. So I say that with love, right? So I want you guys to think about this, right? If you think of like the captain of a fucking soccer team or football, or whatever, is the captain the one that necessarily scores the most goals? Probably not. Okay, or the most tries, you know, enough scores the most fucking hoopies, whatever the game, right? The captain is the one who's self-led. The captain is the one who, when the refs blow their fucking whistle and call in and they go, oh, you know, yellow team, we've got a, you got this happening, blah, blah, blah. The, the captain of that team isn't going to sit on the sideline and go, oh, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, oh, no, he makes a fucking decision. He's self-led. He makes the best decision at that very point in time with the data that he has in front of him. So. If you guys want to be a really fucking good trader, right? Let's bring it back to, 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 to trading and, you know, trading plans, right? A trading plan is the thing that's going to chart your path in your trading goals. Chart your path. That sounds weird, but I'm going to roll with it. Chart your path to your trading goals, okay? Because every single, every single person on here, right, a one in the fucking chat will say that you want consistent profits, is that, is that why you're trading? You want consistent profits. Drop it in the chat. Why else are you actually here? Okay, so this is why you need to think like a, like a self-led captain. Like you're the captain of the fucking ship, right? You're the captain of your business. Trading is a business. Okay, so what business doesn't want consistent profits? We all want, you know, reliable a reliable source of income. Okay, now that's not always possible with trading. The probabilities are there, okay? We all want wealth creation, wealth generation, right? We all, we all want freedom from the man. But how can you expect 
those things from your trading business if it's if if your if your actions are never properly thought out. Okay, this is why, right? If you went onto Shark Tank or whatever, like if you went and saw any venture capitalist, they will not listen to even the best of the business ideas if the person standing in front of them presenting this beautiful, you know, probably highly profitable business if they don't have a business plan written out, if they don't have the numbers written out, if they don't have the forecasts written out. Okay, because if you can't explain to me or anyone on, you know, either verbally or on paper via your trading plan, what your business is about, why your strategy makes sense and how you're going to bring in, you know, profit, how the fuck do you expect to make this in real life? If you don't have a plan or if you do have one and you aren't able to follow it, your actions are then going to be inconsistent and random. Okay, and random randomness of behavior, randomness of action, that's going to give you random results. So that's my take on, on overtrading, right? If you're overtrading, it can be a number of, you know, if we want to bring it back to trading, maybe you're spending too much time executing on time frames that are too low, right? Maybe you've got a lack of data around key levels, timeframes, positions, right? Maybe you, you just lack confidence. So you just take everyone hoping one will work out. Okay, maybe you lack confidence. So you take all the setups in fear that the market may not give you another one. So you're like, shit, if I don't get this one, and that's what Mark, uh, Mike was talking about for scarcity. Okay, so if you're over trading, and it takes on anything that us three have just spoken about, the thing you've got to ask yourself is what am I looking for when I'm on the market? What is my edge? What is my go-to setup? You know, when do I move into my execution timeframe? Am I going too early there, right? What does the data, all the data that I have collected say, right? How many trades have I taken today? What's, how much risk have I risked today? They're all the things you've got to consider, Okay. So my last question to you, and I'm not going to speak on any of these, but what were some bad habits that you both have had that you became aware of and how did you shift them with trading, bad habits with trading? So I, I, just, I just quickly want to take it back to, to over trading real quick as well. Yep. You know, your, your goal shouldn't be, um, your your goal shouldn't be to try and move quicker than everybody else. It should be to move correctly, you know, because when you're moving correctly, you're doing things correctly. You know, you should be focused on quality, not quantity. You could have a guy that places 50 trades, but only up 10%, and a guy places two trades and up 10%. So it's, people have this misconception that they think the more they trade, the more they're going to make. Mm. Well, not necessarily. You know, you can place free trades and, and beat the guy that places 50. So don't think over trading is going to be the quality of your trading because quantity is, is completely irrelevant to your quality. So don't try and be that person that's trying to beat everybody to the first mill. Be the person that does it correctly to the first mill. That's and cool. You can sustain that. So my, my worst mistakes or my, my, my mistakes that I made in my career, um, Leading to where I am right now, still in making mistakes. No one's perfect. I still do it now. Um, you know, there's no smoke and mirrors here. There's, there's still, you know, there's still things that we need to learn as traders, as we still do. Um, but I think one of my biggest mistakes from the beginning was probably the same mistake that a lot of people make, was trying to rush the process rather than trust the process. You know, I was continuously trying to rush um, the money uh, rather than focused on the skill. You know, because I realized it was the skill that was going to pay. It wasn't the money that was going to pay me. Because I realized if I mastered the skill, the money just comes in abundance. So the moment I started focusing and zoning down on what really was the true key course to becoming successful, I started becoming successful within trading because my focus wasn't money. So, yeah, I think, I think money was the big issue because I come from the lack of it. I wanted more of it. And I seen the potential of it. I seen people in the States making some crazy, crazy money. 
And I come in the game coming from a council estate making no money. So I seen it. I was like, that's got to be me in the next couple of months. I have people ask questions like, Leon, in 12 months, can I quit my job? I'm like, your focus shouldn't be quitting your job, bro. Mm. You know, your focus should be learning the skill, not quitting your job. You know, you're going to be working your job till you're 75 years, regardless if you don't do this or not. So if you're going to do this, you make sure you do it properly. Otherwise, you, if you don't do this, you're going to be working your job for 75 years anyway. So you may as well do something. You know, I always ask people is why, even if it takes you a mi- if it takes you 10 years to make a million dollars, would you ever do that work in your job that you're currently working? It's like, no. So 10 years is not even a long time, no? Of course. So why, why, why focus on, I need to make a million dollars within two years, otherwise trading is never going to work for me? Well, if that's the case, you try and make a million dollars from the career that you're pursuing right now. And, you know, it just... It just it just puts people in a perspective of changing the narrative of how they how they think and feel. Because I knew I was a metal sheet fabricator before I started trading. I seen people 50, 60 years old, never even seen a hundred grand in their life. So I knew that was where I was going. I was like, well, shit, even if trading takes me 15 years, guess what? At least I make, you know, good money from it. And so my 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 perspective wasn't always trying to rush it, but I just knew there was a potential too. And that was my downfall. Yeah. So I fixated on a skill rather than the money. Um, but it's hard. I let go, let Mike go, but I'll think of a couple of other things that Perfect. I should do from the beginning. That's great. Mikey. For me, it was addiction. It feels so good to win. <laughs> <laughs> it feels so good to win a trade. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much. It could be $2 addiction, the addiction to that dopamine. And it can be extremely uh, just destructive when you start sacrificing sleep, when you, not that you stop eating, but you don't think about really eating, everything gets focused towards that to where I even blew an account because I I was off Red Bull and Adderall and all sort you know and I passed out literally with my phone I was in my living room at the the first trade house and we had the charts up on a projector and um I think it was I think it was monetary. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was monetary po- monetary policy for the end. Didn't even know what that was at the time. But I was in trades on UJ. I had no idea that that was happening. Passed out just like this. <laughs> yeah, but, but like like my that, phone. I'm sorry to disturb you. Was that an addiction to learning or winning? Winning. Winning. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, because there was no, there was no learning at that. It, it was, I mean, there was definitely learning going on. No, it, absolutely. If I'm going to be honest with myself, it was the dopamine of oh shit, look at this blue numbers, and and then also when it wasn't happening, the pursuit of it. And then also when the direct opposite of what was happening, you know, losing trades, the desire to get that back. That's why I use the word addiction. Why do alcoholics drink? Mm -hmm. For that feeling. Why do smokers smoke? For that feeling. The it it, it, because that's what I'm saying. It transcended. It transcended trading. Now it became an emotion. Now it became again a hit, so to speak. It's a hit. And that is obviously just like any other addiction. Anything in life can be an addiction. Water, too much water can kill you. Mm. Addiction is something that all of us as human beings have to understand. We are habitual human beings. We are habit-based. But not being in control of those habits therefore means that the habits are in control of us and especially at the beginning for me that that lack of uh experience or that lack of understanding of profit have you guys felt it yet have you won a trade 
you know, maybe, maybe it was like, you know, a decent amount, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, $50, a hundred, whatever. Have you felt it? Have you gotten that hit yet? And if you have, and then it, you know, maybe since then, at least potentially just hasn't happened yet. It's like an alcoholic wanting a drink again, or not necessarily, but it can be that way. And that's the answer to this question. That's what it was for me. The moment that I tasted it was the moment I wanted it to continue to happen. And then, of course, what did that result in? More losses, which only created the desire and the distance, you know, between me and that, where it wasn't happening. So, therefore, it was obviously much harder, much, you know, obviously way more difficult. Uh, you, you guys see what I'm saying? It was way, it was a much further reach. It was an addiction. That's the word that I want to use for it. And the thing that I want to leave you guys with is that it is absolutely understandable that it is an addiction, especially if you're new. And even if you haven't won a trade yet, especially even if you haven't withdrawn, when you withdraw at some point, however much money, if it could be $100, it could be $10,000. We, as human beings, cannot allow, as, as hard as this is, because just like what Leon said, we still, at me as well, I'm just, I'm not a robot. I have these emotions. It is so easy to dive into the addiction. Think about gambling, guys. People just pour money into casinos. Do you want to know why? Because they've won at casinos before. That's the psychology. If casinos didn't pay out money, the entire idea, the entire business plan of casinos would have stopped a long time ago. It is deliberate that they pay out because it creates the addiction. I want that feeling again of the, you know, the lights and the, you know, the, the loud noises and the bells and whistles and to, again, get that feeling of winning. It's the same thing with trading, or at least it can't, it, <clears throat> excuse me, at least it can be. And that's what I did. And so again, for in the beginning, I had such an emotional attachment to that hit. It was a hit. And especially when winning trades would happen, that just euphoria not even greed, just the euphoria of the collective emotions that come along with it can be absolutely detrimental. So in the interest of not doing that and how, of course, I have worked on it, not to say that I absolutely have overcome that or anything because I'm a human being, is math. Mm. I do not allow as best as I can, the emotions to control my, uh, my response, so to speak, to the outcome of each individual trade. Because I say this all the time. If you, if we allow ourselves to feel bad or defeated or anything like that, then, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I said this backwards. If we allow ourselves to feel happy and excited and euphoric when we win, you also inadvertently allow yourself to feel the pain and the loss and the guilt of losing. Now, this is a practice. This is not just, oh, I flip on a switch and therefore all emotions are gone. It's a practice. The less we can feel attached to any one particular trade, the easier, guys, all of this becomes to where it's not an addiction. You see what I'm saying? We all can feel that addiction, but it's, of course, like 
especially if if um uh uh so how do you deal with emotions after a win i do my best to not even uh, like how do i deal with it winning feels good absolutely without a doubt winning a trade it feels amazing there's an ego boost there's like oh look at how good i am like everybody internally feels that way but th that kind of thing it's not necessarily uh to that answer so to speak but this is why i personally don't talk about my personal trading on go live or i do everything i can to separate my educator life versus my own personal trading life because my personal trading whatever my results are has nothing to do with anybody else if guys let's say i'm the best trader in the world and you were learning from me and you learn everything that i do to the t does that by definition mean your life is going to change because now somehow you're going to be an amazing trader no my results anybody's results good or bad has no infliction on anybody else because everybody again is in their own personal experience so my point is is that when i'm getting into trades when i finally hit the blue or the red button and i have the take profit in the stop loss there i don't even look at it it, well, I, I mean, okay, yes, I do. But I try to look at it after the fact. Mm. I don't try to sit there and stare at it or dwell. I think that would be the word. I don't sit there and dwell on it. Because the way that I'm thinking about it is that I'm thinking about the next trade and the next trade. Because it is rep. Rep, rep, just like when people go to a gym and pick heavy things up and put them back down over and over and over. They're not thinking about one rep, right? It is a continuation of them. So the way that I think about it is that, yes, I won. Yes, that's the goal. But even if I lost or I won that one trade, that one week, of trades is not going to define me. It's not going to, you know, change my life. Astro it's not going to do any of those things. So I guess the easiest way that I can put it is that I'm lowering the value, the internal mental value, the personal value that I put onto one trade. I do everything I can to lower that. To where again, it's just like, you know, uh, you know, it, I'm gonna flip this coin, right? Is it heads or tails? It I don't know, right? But does it really matter? No, because I don't have anything, of, of course, like on the line for this coin flip, so to speak. That do you guys understand what I'm saying? That's why, or at least in practice, that's what I'm trying to do is lower the internal or the mental value of every single thing that I do. Because if I, again, put a high or incredible value on every single trade that I take, then yeah, have you guys felt it? It is incredibly exhausting and it's defeating to, to, to say, to, you know, put it lightly. Mm lowering your attachments lucky enough for me personally i've never really had attachment issues i'm kind of connected to everything attached to nothing to a type of guy um and i realized that money only magnifies your habits so if you don't fix what you currently are dealing with right now then money is only going to magnify it when you've got millions of dollars mm -hmm. so i realized a lot of people want more of rather than stripping more of you know, people should be thinking about what can I do less of to better my life rather than adding more to my life to to benefit my life. Because you got you got to try and deal with what you've currently got to benefit for the next chapter within your life rather than focusing on what more you can add if you can't even deal with what you currently got. So I think it's super important that, you know, 
you try and de-attach de yourself from the attachment issues that you have towards trading. You know, whether I make 10 grand or 100 grand, I don't know whether this is ego or pride, and I don't like to say this, but it doesn't really bother me what I make because I realize that it's, I'm not bothered with what trading can do. I'm bothered with what trading can, the money that it can do with in my internal life. That's why I am personally, I'm not passionate about trading. I tell people this all the time. I'm, I'm not passionate about trading. I'm passionate about what trading brings to my life. I'm passionate about the money that it allows me to buy freedom, help my family out, all the accessories and stuff that it brings me. I'm not passionate about actually staring at charts and making money from them. That's the least of my passions. But I'm passionate about what trading brings me. So don't feel you have to feel attached and you have to be super passionate about trading to make money from it. Because you don't. You've got to be passionate about what trading can bring to your life. That is the passion. Couldn't agree more. My, um, my shitty little habit back in the day was, <laughs> uh, because I didn't, I was like too noisy in like chat rooms and discords. And you'll notice that I very rarely participate in trading chat. Um, and simply because that was for like my own, that was my pitfall when I was first forgetting. And so for me, my downfall was taking small profits really quickly. Like as soon as I made profit, I'd close the trade out. <laughs> um, or I would move my stop loss if it wasn't going my way and I would just remove it completely and just fucking hope that it would turn around like that's what I would do when I was a novice um and the actually the only time I've been I've, there. I think we've all been there though yeah we've all been, we've been there, there. Yeah. yeah 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 my other thing was um you know I've only ever done that when I was a good trader um when I put a trade on in my sleep right um it was like probably this time last year and I was like, what, 8K down on GU? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, that, that woke up. And so I removed MetaTrader from my phone because I can't be trusted um, in my sleep. Was it a benefit trade or was it a negative trade? It was negative, but it was, I was, I've like screamed, like fucking called Mark. I'm like, what do I do? Um, but I knew what to do, right? I understood, once you understood price action and market structure, I actually, instead of closing it then and there, I did an analysis, see where the fuck I was at. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to wait um, until I get to, and don't, this is hundred percent. One of those don't do as I do conversations, like do as I say, like don't take what I say right here as Bible. Um, I did a, I like, I just looked over the charts in a markup and I waited till it came back. And it was, I was literally in a little retracement and I closed it out at like two and a half negative instead of eight. Right. So I, I made a calculated, still took a hit, but it was like, wasn't a oh shit I'm gonna trade I'm gonna close it out like once you become fluid on the charts losses like that won't phase you guys because you'll know how to manage them you'll be like all right fuck that was a dumb thing to do how can I get out of this because in, in, a, in a normal sense like people would be highly reactive and highly emotional when that happens I like laughed I was like what a dumbass um <laughs> so yeah I've done that twice actually so no more mt4 on my friend <laughs> there was a time where I was flying um, and I placed a, I placed a trade just before I was about to fly off, um, and I lost signal to be able to set a stop loss. Oh, that's and, right. um, Yeah. So, but lucky enough, when I landed, yeah, it, it did go in my favor. So I got pretty lucky with that one. To be honest, it wasn't a negative. So <laughs> I was happy with that. Amazing. That's so good, guys. So we love tonight's convo. I think just to recap all of this, we should have a good understanding that really good traders or good traders we are excellent risk management managementers managers <laughs> um we're independent thinkers our focus is on growth and development Crit critical thinking critical thinking correct Especially and have failed more yeah we failed more than we succeeded that's for sure oh yeah yeah so if you guys want to want everything that your mentors have, I suggest you keep showing up. You don't let the shit Fail, down. Failing forward is the only way. You have to figure out a thousand ways to not do something. Not the one way of how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll ne <laughs> you have to find a thousand ways to not do it. That's good. Mm. I like that.
but people give up in the midst of that. Oh yeah, the they first time, much they less could a thousand. They can literally, you know, do it a million times and give up on that one time and that last time or the next time after that could have been the day they succeeded. That was my biggest fear to quit on something and then the next day I could have succeeded at it. So I just knew I had to keep going. Regardless. My favorite quote from the one of my favorite mentors in life is Bruce Lee. I do not fear the man that practices 10,000 kicks one time. I fear the man that practices one kick 10,000 times. I'm going to get that tattooed on me. Not the kick part, but <laughs> just I, you know, 10,000 different things one time versus one thing 10,000 times. Yeah, powerful. Love it. Guys, this will be up tomorrow. Please send me your breakthroughs. I think there was about 17 and pretty sure there's fucking more than that from the wisdom that was shared on this call. So if you're watching the recording, please make sure you write to me, send me your breakthroughs or your Blue Wolves count. We've got a mission that Trade House is on a, on a mission for. So appreciate you all, Leon, Mike. It's been a hoot. Thank you, SJ. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Love, Love you guys. Thank you all for the time. Yeah. For real, I hope it was helpful in any way. For sure. And guys, bring the topics to us. This is like open mic night. Okay. So whatever, whatever you guys want, we're here to deliver. And I'll see you guys next week. Same time, same link. Thank you again, guys. Have a good night.